Hello. Can somebody let me know if you can hear me? I can hear you. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Let me get settled here. Give, uh, we'll probably take three or four minutes and we'll, we'll get going here. Just want to let a few more people get here. Hey, Kathleen, can you hear me? Hey, Steve. Yeah. Uh, before we start class, um, I was just wondering if you still have the same email address. No. Did you get an email from the college? Yeah, so that was kind of weird because I'm like, wouldn't Steve tell us? I wanted to make sure and double check that that was yeah. actual for real. Yeah, no, they, they uh, oh wow, my pen just exploded. <laughs> uh, yeah, my email has changed. I'm sorry, I have to go clean up. I just got pen all over myself, so I'll be okay, back. I'll <laughs> All right, I'm only slightly stained from that pen. Just one second here. Yeah. <clears throat> hey, Kathleen, can you hear me now? Kathleen's having some problems hearing, so um, let's give us a couple more minutes to get this figured out.
Just so you all know, I'm going to send out a quick email to all the students uh, just to remind them that we are actually having class tonight. So give me one second here. <clears throat> Good, it looks like there are a few more people logging in now. <clears throat> All right, I'm gonna um, start a little bit. We won't get right into the material because I wanted to just talk about um, not having class last week and having a class video and that sort of thing. So, and I also wanted to mention, Kathleen, can you hear me now? Kathleen's having audio issues at school. Hello? Hey, Kathleen. I still can't hear you. Um, uh, awful. Do you know anything about computers? Um, I don't know. Kind of, sort of. Like how they get, see, I can't hear anything that they're saying. Um. Well, the mic, where's the mic at? Are the speakers? When I couldn't hear you, I just logged off and then logged back on. Okay, yeah, she's having I'm problems. turning up the speaker volume. She's having problems because she's in the classroom by herself. I'm actually teaching from home tonight. So, trying to troubleshoot a little bit here. Sure There's a little bit, but we still can't hear anything. Can you hear now? Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Yes. Oh. Mm. I don't know. Maybe look in the back again. Maybe. I'll try. How about now? We still can't hear. You can't? Gosh, feel bad. <laughs> Look at the speaker icon. Speaker icon.
on the bottom of the screen next to time. Uh, I'll get my computer. She might have to push escape first. Oh, yeah? Because you know how when you get, log on first, it's a full screen, and then you have to push escape. Then she can see the little speaker by the time. Oh, like video. Oh. And she can use her own. We can hear you, Ty. Turn up the speaker volume. We do. Was that you, Kathleen? It's hard with this instructor's computer that she's logged in because multiple, like, different instructors use it. Some of them will turn on the sound and some will turn off. Did you figure it out or not? No. Okay. All right. Well, while she gets her computer out, um, one second here, I'll talk a little bit about... The assignments, uh, or not the assignments, but the class video last week um, and the assignments that were previously given out. Um, and I also, because I think we had a couple more people log in here, just to let you know, um, my email changed last Friday. The IT department, did, department didn't give me any notice about it. And so unfortunately, I couldn't <laughs> let you guys know because I didn't have access to my old email account. So finally today, um, or, yet, or I should say on Friday, I left a message, and hopefully you all got a message saying that my email address had changed, and it's almost the same. It's just, uh, there's, it's SR Zawoski, not just S Zawoski. So, and I do have access to that now. Um, I literally just got back from California this afternoon, so I apologize if I haven't responded uh, to any of your emails. Um, I'm just... Uh, I need to get caught up here, so along with the grading that I need to do for you guys. So first of all, that'll be the new email address, so just start sending email to that. Um, I do uh, get email. And um, the other thing I wanted to cover briefly was just to look at week number six, which was in the class video that I put out there. So if you haven't logged into Canvas, go ahead and log into Canvas right now. and. Uh, just want to make sure we're all on the same page here. That. <clears throat> and I will share my screen here. Okay. That's week seven. I'm just going to publish this week's, uh, I just literally published week seven. Um, ignore the assignments. Just one second, they turn themselves back on. Um, ignore the assignments if you see any for week seven. Hopefully you won't. Um, but in week six, which was last week, so, uh, and I apologize again for not, um, having class last Tuesday, we had some students and, and including myself have had a daughter who had some school issues. And so um, I needed to record it from home, which I did on Wednesday morning. So if you haven't watched that video, which is class video 3217 uh, for the date, obviously from last week, uh, watch that because essentially what I covered in there were the last six um, calculations from uh, the chapter four financial calculations that we worked on. So in the class previously, to, in the previous class to that, we had worked on numbers one through five, current ratio, quick ratio, inventory turnover ratio, day sales outstanding, and debt ratio is what we did. Uh, I guess that would have been in February, the class uh, before last week. And then that class video, which is March 2nd, um, and it's under... Oops, excuse me. Um, it's under uh, week number six. Uh, in that video, I covered times interest earned, 
return on equity, return on assets, operating margin, and profit margin. So at that point, after you've watched that video, uh, I'll have covered all of the 10. We're not going to cover all of the financial ratios, by the way, in Chapter 4. We're just going to cover these 10. So um, if you haven't watched that video, watch it, because that's, that's how we're covering uh, those calculations in class this quarter. Unfortunately, with all the weather uh, and things and, and other issues and me being sick one week, um, we're behind. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how um, how it's going to work through the end of the quarter. Um, so watch that video if you haven't. Let me go back here. And then the other things, so the other assignments that were uh, associated with that uh, was to complete the um, Boeing financial worksheet calculations. I had a couple questions about that, um, about how that worked. So that essentially uh, those financial worksheet calculations are the same ones we did in class previously. Um, and the financials themselves, if you open that document, it's an Excel document. It has an income statement on one tab and on another tab it has a balance sheet. So those are what you're gonna use to figure out the financial ratios uh, one through 10. Um, after you've watched the video. So this is another good reason to watch that video um, because you'll need to know uh, how to do six through 10 uh, on this Boeing financial. So the first page is a balance sheet and the second page is an income statement. And so you'll use those two to then figure out the uh, 10 financial ratios from chapter four. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about how that works? If you haven't watched both of the previous class videos, you definitely need to do that because that's gonna, uh, unless you just use the book, you'll need to uh, uh, know how to calculate those ratios. But does that make sense as far as the Boeing financials go? Anybody have any questions? Um, my only question was if, for the Bellingham Herald, you only wanted the first five ratios, right? And then for the Boeing, you want us to do all 10? No, so you know, let's go back to the previous week. Um, so we, if you look under week five mm -hmm. here, so because we had only covered um, the first five ratios, oh yeah, I didn't update that. So yeah, you're right actually. Um, I was thinking I was gonna update week six and ask you to do all 10 for the Bellingham Herald, but yeah, that's fine. Let's just stick with that and so for the previous week, there was an assignment to do the first five ratios that we covered in class with Bellingham Herald. And so, yeah, that's fine. We'll just stick with that. Okay. And then for under week six with the Boeing financials, then do all 10 for that week or for that assignment. Yep. Okay. Anybody else have questions about that Boeing financials calculation or assignment? I also had questions about the chapter four, uh, uh, four dash 11 um, assignment. So let me just briefly show that to you. Um, under assignments, the first document is actually just a, a scanned copy of that uh, particular question. Um, and so if you open it up, and you can find this in your book too, um, in edition seven, it's on page 126. But, and so basically what I'm asking you to do here for 411 is to do, like I said, A through five, or excuse me, A through I. I ask you to do some of these. Uh, I'll look back at it in a second here. Um, but what we're looking for here in 4-11 is it's asking you to determine, and so you'll do this with your knowledge of financial statements and what happens on financial statements that we've talked about. Um, what happens when uh, one of these transactions occurs? How does it affect the current assets of the corporation? How does it affect the current ratio? And how does it, what's the impact on net income? So for each of these um, uh, questions or, <clears throat> excuse me, each of these uh, actions in 4-11, you'll need to put something in each one of these um, blanks here. 
you'll either put a you'll put a plus if you, if it's to increase it you'll put a minus to decrease it or you'll put a zero if there's no impact so I think they had an example they didn't actually have an example here so let me show you real quick um, how this works with a for instance so in 4-11a uh, it says cash is acquired through issuance of additional common stock so the company sells uh, more stock and they acquire cash so if that was the only thing that happened what would you say would happen to the current assets of that company would they increase stay the same or decrease anybody see sir yes that was confusing to me because in the instructions it says assume that the current ratio is 1.0 or better. So does that mean in the current ratio, in each line, it's going to be 1.1 1 .1 or more, I guess? Um, it just says, assume that it will be some number over one, yeah, for the current ratio. But that doesn't necessarily tell us, or what does it tell us about uh, A? What will happen if A actually if it occurs, if they sell additional stock, then what's going to happen to the ratio? If that's the only thing that happens, yeah. See, it, I it says assume. So when I assumed, I assumed that A through I, each current ratio was 1.0. Okay, we're not looking for what that actual current ratio is, though. You need to read. You need to read what's over here, and you just need to determine if it's going to cause that ratio to go up, go down, or stay the same. So I think it's zero minus plus. All right, so Doris, uh, all right, so in other words, zero for total current assets. Um, let's see, cash is acquired through issuance of additional stock. So that would actually be a plus because selling stock, it would increase their cash. And so if everything else stayed the same, then their current assets are gonna increase um, because common stock isn't a current asset, it's, a, it's an equity. Um, so it would actually be plus for this. So um, I can't do this here on the screen. I don't think I can mark it up. Maybe I can, let's see. We'll see. So technically, oh cool, I've never used this feature before. So that would be a plus. So you put that there. That would be the impact of selling more stock and getting cash. It would increase your total assets. How about the current ratio? Um, so this is this is the number one or, or the uh, financial calculation that's on your worksheet. What do you think would happen to the current ratio if they sold stock and got more cash? Increase, decrease, or stay the same? How about you, David? What do you think? Increase, decrease, or stay the same for the current ratio? Well, um. I think it would increase because if assets go up, that means equity has to go parallel with that. So I would say increase. Yep, I would agree, yeah. So current ratio would also increase because you're not taking on any, any extra debt. Um, and so that wouldn't have a negative impact on it, um, but you are increasing your cash. So yeah, I would agree. This current ratio would also go up for this one. And then the last one, the effect on net income. Anybody, what, what do you think the effect on net income of selling stock is? I also put a plus in there. That's actually not a plus. Anybody else have a guess or a, an answer? I shouldn't say yes. Oh. Kathleen, can you hear us now? I think it will. It's a minus, and the reason is because the net income was from last year. It might affect next year, but not. It won't affect the spreadsheet that we're working on currently. Hmm. Yeah. I think actually, what happens? Oh, I can't do it with a line. Um, if I could draw a zero, I would draw it right here, but I can't really. To draw these little things. This is the oh. ugliest zero that you've ever seen, but that is a zero there. Um, yeah, because just selling stock, they get more cash, but it doesn't make them any money, right? It's just like they're selling part of the company away. 
to raise cash, but it also means um, that um, that they are taking on additional owners, right? They're taking on stockholders. So that would actually be a, a zero. It would um, have no impact uh, on the income or the net income. Yeah. Does that make sense? Okay. And you can hear us and everything, right? Excellent. All right. Um, yeah, so this is how you would do it. You would go down and, and you would essentially just read each of these descriptions and then try to figure out how that would impact total current assets, current ratio, and effect on net income. And I think I said A through I. Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah, so go through A, excuse me, A to I there. And um, it kept my pluses though. Let me get rid of these pluses. Here are all drawing. Great, okay. Uh, go through A, A through I and do all of those plus minus or, uh, or zero depending on what it, what it does. Let me see. So that was a second assignment from last week. And the other one was just to read chapter five because we're gonna start getting into um, chapter five tonight, some examples. Um, and in chapter five, essentially the, the only thing we're working on uh, from chapter five are time value money calculations. So tonight we're gonna start working, uh, doing a good amount of work in Excel um, for the chapter five time value money exercises. So, so any questions? So week six was last week. I should probably put a date uh, on these, but um, so all the resources from last week, there was a class video uh, that I mentioned, and then there's the blank financial calculations worksheet. Um, and then I also showed a complete example of the allied food products calculations. So in chapter three, you have financial statements for the allied food products, which is what I talked, uh, which is what we figured out in class two weeks ago as we worked on those financial calculations. So if you wanna see uh, and compare how each of, actually one through 10 of those chapter four calculations, how they were figured out based on, I think it's tables 3-1 and 3-2. Um, there's an income statement and a balance sheet for allied food products in chapter three. And so these are the examples that we worked on. And if you go through it, you'll see where, or you should uh, be able to look at the financial statements and see um, where these numbers came from if you have a question about any of those. So that's another resource you can use, especially on those uh, new uh, financial calculations, six, six through 10 there. So I'd highly recommend you look at that. If you're, having, if you're having issues with any of those chapter four financial ratios, one, view the previous two class videos, and two, look at that. Um, Allied food products example that's in there. All right. And I think that was it. Yeah, chapter five. So, any other questions before we um, get into use it, to get into a chapter five time value money exercises? No? Silent? Okay. Um, what about the quiz? I thought we were supposed to be taking a quiz today. Uh, you are not taking uh, the in-class portion. Uh, thank you for reminding me. That was the other thing I was going to say. So we had talked two weeks ago about having um, an in-class portion of the test because the uh, essay questions that were assigned two weeks ago were due last Tuesday. I believe they were due last Tuesday. They were due on February 28th. Right, so that's the first part of the test. I've, I've only gotten, I think, nine of those. So if you haven't completed those essay questions, I suggest you do them uh, soon, uh, like within the next day, if you want any credit at all, because they're already pretty overdue. Um, so the second part of the test is going to be, uh, or is going to be, um, related to the information in chapters one through three that we covered. Um, and so I was planning on doing that in class last week, but because we didn't have class last week, we couldn't do it 
uh, there. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to post it as a take home, uh, basically a take home assignment. And I'm going to post it tomorrow. And this is how I typically do uh, take home essay questions. You essentially have one day to complete it. So I'm going to post that to Canvas tomorrow um, by five o'clock and it'll be due on Thursday, uh, or excuse me. Yeah, it'll be due on Thursday by five o'clock. So basically you'll have 24 hours to do it. And it'll be, um, I think 12 questions, I think is what it is. So um, look for that tomorrow. I'll send out an email to everyone um, once I posted it, just so you know it's there, but look for it by five, five o'clock tomorrow and it'll be due the next, it'll be due by Thursday. And I would say do it in class, but the reason um, we're gonna skip it in class is because Again, we're behind and I want to get through um, pretty much all of the, or most of the time value money calculation examples tonight. So um, that's what we're going to be doing for the rest of the night is working from chapter five of the time value money calculations. I have a question. Yep. Um, this last assignment, I've already turned it in, but the question 411 since I didn't thoroughly understand it, I left the current ratio all blank. Okay. Yeah, so what you can, uh, why don't you just resubmit it? Why don't you finish it and you can resubmit it? Because I think I only received four of those so far. So based on what we talked about tonight, if you just want to finish up the current ratio, if you left those all blank, and then you can resubmit it to the same assignment link. You can submit more than one assignment. So if you make a mistake, and this is, I suppose, good for everyone to know, if you make a mistake or don't complete an assignment, or I ask you to change something in the assignment and then resubmit it, just resubmit it to the same link. Canvas will save both of those submissions. So does that make sense, David? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, yep. All right, so any other questions before we launch into chapter five here? I'm hoping I'm not going to disappear from your screen because my chair slowly sinks in this room. So if all of a sudden you're just looking at my forehead, let me know and I'll move the chair. Let me do it right now. You can tell I'm at my home office because that's my daughter's art area back there. So that's actually clean. It was a real mess. So. That was magic. You grew. There you go. See? Yeah, now I can turn it up. The pneumatics in this is are messed up apparently. All right. So um, if everybody can go into Canvas under week seven, which is where we are tonight. Excuse me. And there is um, a document called Blank Time Value of Money Calculation Spreadsheet right at the top of resources there. If you want to open that up. We're going to be using that tonight to work on the time value money calculations. Am I the only one not seeing chapter seven? Uh, chapter seven or week seven? Um, try to, if you can't see chapter, or excuse me, week seven, um, I would log in and log out because I literally just posted it uh, at the beginning of class tonight. Can anyone else, can everyone else see week number seven there? I can see it. I can see it. Okay, great. Yeah, just, Doris, just try to log in and see. Should we download it? Yeah, down, definitely download this Excel spreadsheet because you're going to be, you're going to be working in it. For that's a good, uh, that will be how we'll be practicing tonight. So yeah, don't just open it up in, in the view of your browser, download it and open it in Excel. Okay. So what we're gonna be doing in chapter five, like I said, is uh, strictly the time value money calculation. So this is another mathy chapter. Um, and you're going to be doing a good amount of uh, calculations, but it will all be in Excel. So uh, hopefully that will, uh, the intent is that it will make that easier. Um, 
Uh, and actually, I've had one student in the past use a financial calculator to try to do these. I do, don't recommend that because financial calculators are all different and I certainly am not an expert on all the versions. And so what I'm teaching you uh, in chapter five is all gonna be out of Excel. If for some reason, I've mentioned this before, but if for some reason you don't have access to Excel, you need to get access to Excel because everything we're gonna be doing in chapter five is there. So if that's a problem, let me know and we'll, I'll see what we can do to figure that out. But <clears throat> So everything uh, that we're gonna be covering in chapter five are these time value money calculations. Let me share my screen here. <clears throat> Okay, and get, yeah, go ahead and open that on your own computer too. So this Excel spreadsheet, um, this Excel spreadsheet um, covers all of the time value money calculations that we're gonna be using. Uh, can you make sure you're muted, everyone? I'm hearing a bunch of feedback. Hearing a baby. Um, and the, the time value of money calculations that we're gonna be doing are uh, future value, present value, interest rate, time periods, I, I, payment, and then actually we're doing six. Um, and the other one is uh, the internal rate of return, or IRR. So these are the six uh, equations you're gonna learn out of chapter five. Um, but first, I just wanna cover a little bit about the, uh, from a conceptual uh, standpoint about why it's important to know these and understand um, how they can be used in business, really, more than anything else. Um, and to understand that, you need to understand the difference between simple and compound interest. And so right at the top of that spreadsheet, you can see an area here um, that has two different examples of simple and compound interest, um, or excuse me, one example of simple interest and one example of compound interest. And I think this is the easiest way for me to explain uh, how they work. And so we'll start with simple interest. So simple interest essentially is calculated once a year. So if you think about having money in a bank account, and let's say you have a savings account. You can tell I'm shrinking again. Um, and let's say you make a whopping 1% interest back on your savings account, right? So if you make 1% in interest a year on your savings account, and you have a hundred bucks in there. How much interest are you gonna earn in that year? One percent and you have a hundred bucks. How much interest do you earn at the end of the year? One dollar. One dollar, thank you, Doris. Yes, one dollar, because it's one percent, right? So um, that's how simple interest works. You get essentially an interest payment once a year. And so the example here shows um, that we're getting an 8% return, which is, I'm just using an arbitrary number here to sort of explain how this works. And PV, so throughout the rest of the quarter, if you hear me say PV, that means present value. It's just an abbreviation uh, for present value. So, and that means what it's worth right now, today. So, we start on day one with a thousand bucks in this example. We're earning 8% interest. And so that means at the end of the first year, we're gonna have, we're gonna have $80 in interest. That's 8% of a thousand is $80. So at the end of the first year, our bank account will have 1,080 in it. If that's all we do, if we just stick a thousand bucks in there and we earn 8%, we'll have 1,080 at the end of the year. Um, this one, two, three, four, five up here, this represents years. So the first year, second year, third year, fourth year. If you leave it in there for five years, 
at the end of five years, you'll have $1,400, right? It's pretty straightforward. Um, actually, this is, this is not right. Let me fix this. So this is, if you've ever typed formulas in Excel, this is what I'm doing right now. All right. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. That was compound interest. So simple interest works this way. It pays you the same amount every year, um, once a year only. So it compounds once a year. Compound interest works slightly differently than that. Compound can, I, can, I, can I hold you off for a second? Are, yep. we, are we saying that we're going to hold this $1,000 in this bank account for five years and they're going to agree to pay us $400? That's simple interest. Cor correct. Well, a couple things. One, it could be, a, that would be a five-year, right? That would be a five-year um, amount of interest that you earn on $1,000, right? $80 every year for five years. But, and this is where this particular example is wrong, is that this assumes that you take that 80 out every year or that you, you leave the $1,000 in there and you keep the $80 in interest. So, um, Almost that, like a stock. Yeah, like a dividend payment or something like that. But this is based on interest, right? Okay. Yeah, thank you for clarifying. I actually need to change this example because um, that's not real clear. But with simple interest, it's just saying that you have $1,000 in there, and that's what your interest is going to be calculated on every year. So every year, what this shows is that you earn $80 in interest. So at the end of, as Doris was saying, at the end of five years, you have $400 in interest here. Um, with compound is interest, it's, it's different. What happens is they take the $80 that you earn in the first year and they add it to the balance for the second year. And so the second year, they actually calculate the interest based on 1,080 as opposed to just 1,000. And so you see at the end of the second year, you actually earn a little bit more than $80. You earn 8640 because now you're earning the same amount of interest, 8%. But you're earning it on 1,080 as opposed to 1,000. So every year, as your balance starts to grow, and and you continue to be paid at 8 percent, the amount that you earn grows too, right? At the end of the second year, um, this particular, all we're doing here is adding the interest back into the balance of that. At the end of the second year, the balance is going to be 1166.40. And when we multiply 8% times that, that gives us $93.31. So every year you earn more and more interest, and it's just based on the fact that you're leaving that interest in the account. And so there's more um, interest to be earned on a larger account, right? You're slowly building up your account. And so by the end, by the fifth year, you're earning now $108.84 in interest because at the beginning of that year, you had a $1,360 balance. So it just continues to go up. It's, as long as you don't remove the money from there, it will keep increasing like that. It's called the compounding effect. So- I have a question. Yep. Okay, now, as, as if I put money in the bank, is my bank gonna allow me to choose compound interest or simple interest? No, they said it. <laughs> Yeah, they set it, and actually, some banks compound their interest um, every quarter or every three months. Like credit, my credit union compounds their savings account every three months. They'll pay you your interest at the end of three months. Um, some banks compound it every month. Technically, you could compound it every day, which is what credit card companies do. When they charge you interest, this is the other way to think about this, when a company charges you interest, they also compound it, and they compound it uh, based on different time periods, or they could, potentially. Credit cards, or any line of credit or loan, compounds it every day. Why do you think they compound the interest of a loan every day, if they can? So they can charge you the most interest that they possibly can? 
Got it. Yeah, because that then the bank earns. If you think about, um, if you think about this as a loan, this second example, the compound interest, um, you can see how compounding actually increased the amount of interest. Um, that the bank would earn, essentially the bank is earning interest at this point because they're loaning you money. Um, and they earn more and more interest if it's, if it's compounded uh, more regularly. And so credit cards, you know, they basically take your average daily balance and they'll calculate that but they, um, for, the, for the interest that they charge. Same with home loans, they, they, they calculate that daily. And so, the more the the shorter the duration of the compounding period, like if they compound it every day, that's better than if they compound it every month, which is better than if they compound it every three months, which is better if they only compound it once a year. So the the more that they compound it, the easier, or I should say, the more interest that you earn. So that works both for you and in some situations and against you in other situations. Because if it's in your bank account, the more compounding that happens, the better, because you're earning the interest in that situation. But if it's for a loan, a car loan, a home loan, a credit card, the more compounding benefits the bank at that point, because they're the ones who are then charging you interest uh, for that money. Yeah, so that's just saying that if it's your money that's sitting in the bank, they're not going to compound it because they're compounding what you owe them. So why would they do that? Well, they, because they have to compete for your money with other banks to some degree, right? So they do that with, uh, and the way that banks compete is by offering better interest rates. You know, maybe, uh, I think my credit union right now, the savings account pay a whopping 0.5%. So if I had a hundred bucks and left it in there all year long, I'd, I'd earn 50 cents. Just think about how, how easily you could retire on 50 cents. Yeah. That's wouldn't, wouldn't it be more feasible to buy a bond because that's less risk no a bond is more, a longer time a bond is more risk than than putting your money in a bank um oh, it is. when you put money in the bank it's guaranteed each of your accounts at a bank is guaranteed up to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. so if the bank goes under the government the the u.s government guarantees that they they have an insurance basically policy for the bank and they say okay if this bank goes down, then we are going to uh, pay up to $250,000 or, or make sure each of the customers who has an account, um, their money is guaranteed up to $250,000. So if the bank can't pay you, if they go out of business for some reason, then the government will step in and pay you. And so those are deposit accounts, like checking accounts and savings accounts are uh, depository accounts. Um, and they're guaranteed, again, by the federal government in the form of the uh, FICA, uh, excuse me, FICA. Um, F-I-D something? Oh, F-D-I-C, thank you. Yeah, the Federal Depository Insurance Company is what that stands for, F-D-I-C. Um, and that's the government agency that guarantees checking and savings accounts. If you're investing, if you're buying a bond or a stock, if you're investing in those, there is no guarantee, any government guarantee at least, on those. And so if a company whose bond you purchase or stock you purchase uh, goes bankrupt, you potentially could lose all, some or all of the, um, the investment that you had for either that bond or the, the stock. Okay, so what happens, what determines if a bank went out of business, what determines the amount the federal government is going to give you because you say up to, but what determines the exact amount? Well, whatever, if, unless you have, if you have any amount in that bank under $250,000, then they're going to give you all of that. But if for some reason, if you're a really lucky guy and you have an account and for whatever not very smart reason, you have over $250,000 in that account, let's say you had 300,000 in an account and the bank went down, the government's only going to guarantee you two hundred fifty thousand, so you potentially can lose fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, based on that. So that's um, yeah, that's how the the insurance for the bank works. Is they will they will guarantee up to two hundred fifty, but anything above that they won't. The government won't guarantee. So what if you had two hundred fifty in three different accounts? Um, 
they would need to be under, like you could have 250 in an account for you, and if you're married, you could have 250 in an account for you and your wife, and they would consider those two accounts separately, but you can't just have multiple, establish multiple accounts. It, it's, based, it's, uh, it's tied to the person, essentially, whose accounts. So for instance, the college, when they buy certificates of deposit, they'll buy a certificate of deposit at uh, multiple banks. And so the insurance for each account is specific to the bank. So if the college has an account at Chase, if, uh, and then they have an account at, let's say, the Bank of New York, and these are certificates of deposits, at each of those banks, they have guarantees up to 250000 So they could potentially buy a $250,000 bond at one bank, bank number one, let's say, and a $250,000 bond at bank number two, and they would be fully guaranteed because they're at separate banks. Uh, but if they had two CDs at the same bank, then only up to, basically only uh, up to 250,000 would be covered on those two CDs. So that's, um, that's how the, the, the depository insurance works. It's based on an entity, either a business or an individual, per entity and then per bank. So if you have a lot of money and you wanna keep it in CDs or savings or checking, then you need to spread it out among uh, multiple banks if you want to be fully insured. Yeah, I can say, um, there, you know, by no means I had that um, that amount of money in the bank, but I do have three separate accounts with the same bank, you know, checking, savings, and a CD. Right, yeah. So, yeah, my understanding of it is in total you can have um, up to 250000 in a in one bank and they will, uh, your deposits will be fully guaranteed. But after you rise above that level, unless it's, uh, well, uh, I guess I'm just referring to your specific accounts. Um, you could have up to 250 guaranteed. And then after that, again, you potentially could lose some of that. But okay, it does the last question. So the FDIC, is that different with different banks? No, it's the same. The FDIC covers all banks, yeah. All right, so sorry for the diversion there, but those were good questions. That's sort of how the FDIC insurance works. Um, so getting back to this, uh, compound interest, if you're the one uh, investing the money or you're the one whose account is earning interest, you want it to compound as much as possible. And all of the equations that we're gonna be using here in chapter five, the future value, present value, interest rate, um, they're all based on, they're assuming that uh, compounding is going on. And I'll show how that works in a second. One of the reasons I, was, I suggested that you have this Excel sheet open is because as I'm going through these examples tonight, you really should be doing the same thing uh, so that if you run into any problems, um, or, uh, then we can address them tonight. Um, really, it should be pretty straightforward, especially if you're using this um, uh, the spreadsheet here. And you can continue to use this if you like this format uh, for these time value money um, calculations in all of your assignments through the end of the quarter when we ask these types of questions. So, okay, so let me just start briefly. I'm gonna go through one or two of these examples and then we'll take a break and, and finish it off. Um, but these are all found again in chapter five. And these are used by companies and individuals to try to determine what's gonna happen with an investment or a project, what the rate of return is, um, what the value today is, what the value of the future is. And so we're gonna use some examples on, I think they're in week seven. Yeah, the other document, just go ahead and open up. Um, is the in-class TBM exercises document under week seven, because these are the uh, examples that we're gonna be using. And you can down, you can either download it in Word or you can just view it, but I typically download it just so I can have multiple windows open at the same time. <clears throat> and all of the questions essentially from chapter five are gonna be in very similar format to these questions, both on the assignments and for the test at the end of, of the quarter. So get used to these. Um, so if you open that up, you'll see six different 
uh, time value money exercises. And this is what I'm going to use to show you how this works in Excel. So let me see here. I had this open twice. Okay. So we're going to start with number one here in these time value money exercises. And I'll just say that in general, you need to you need to understand what the question is asking for first, and then you need to figure out which of the time value money equations you're going to use, because you'll be using one of these six equations here um, down below. And I think I set these up so that we would go from top to bottom on that Excel spreadsheet. Well, let me just see. Sure. <clears throat> okay, so we'll start with number one here. It says you invest $2,000 per year in your IRA, which is an individual retirement account. If you do this for 20 years and your IRA has an average rate of return of 5%, how much money will you have when you retire? So what you're going to be picking out of each of these questions are variables that we feed to these equations. And the variables are rate, or the interest rate, um, N per, which stands for number of time periods of time, so it would be like if it was a 10-year investment, uh, the N per would be 10. Um, FV, which stands for future value, PV, which stands for present value, and PMT, which stands for payment. And you can see all of that um, in column A here on the example sheet. So we're going to need to use those particular variables to figure out the answers to these questions. So let's think about this question, though. What is it asking you for? What are you finding out in question one? How much money will you have when you retire? So the future in a compound? Right, yeah. So it's asking you how much money you'll have when you retire, which is like asking how much money will you have in the future, right? So if you want to figure out how much money you'll have in the future, you use the future value formula. Okay, right? so that's the first thing you need to figure out is which of these formulas do I need to use to then answer the question? And for question one, it's future value. So if we go back here, it says you invest $2,000 per year in your IRA for retirement. So of these five variables here, future value, present value, interest rate, time periods, or payment amount, what do you think 2,000, which of those variables is $2,000 per year? Actually, this is, let me just do this as an example so that you understand. I think it's pretty hard just to ask that question. So the answer is $2,000 per year is a payment, it's considered a payment. Anything that happens more than once, on these chapter five um, uh, time value money exercises, if it happens for several months in a row or 10 months or happens for 10 years or five years or whatever, that will always be the payment variable. And so in this question for number one, we have a $2,000 payment per year for retirement. Here's a key thing to, to know about these variables. You can either enter, uh, you can enter FV, PV, or PMT as either negatives or positives. Um, and when you think about whether it should be a negative or positive, because we know that 2,000 should go into PMT, but the question is, should it be a negative 2,000 or a positive 2,000? Think about it this way. If you are the person who you want to, or if you're the person who's retiring, and you're investing $2,000 per year in your IRA, it's going, it essentially is going away from you, right? It, it, you're not losing it. I'm not saying it's going away, but you're investing it. So you're taking it from your checking account and putting it in your IRA. So think about the money flowing to another account. It's actually moving away from you. And so that would be, you would actually enter negative. Whenever movie, or excuse me, money flows away from you, it's going to be negative. Whenever money flows to you, it'll be a positive here under PM. That's crazy because it's saying that you, you're, you're, you're investing, but it's a payment. 
Well, it's, it's, all, it's only, no, it's only a payment because it happens more than once, right? You're doing it every year for 20 years, I think. And so um, that's why it's considered a payment. I would think of it like a house, making a payment on a house every day. Even though you're, the money's flowing away from you, you're still investing in, a, in something that's going to give you a return later in life. Right. Yeah, and it, that's, that's a good way to say it, Doris, because the other thing that this is going to give you, the answer to the question is, how much money will you have when you retire? So I'll tell you that the answer to the question is going to be positive because you'll have that money at the end, right? This is just assuming that you're doing something, you're investing this money for 20 years, $2,000 a year at 5%. Then when you retire, all that money is going to come back to you. And that's, then that would be a positive money. If you think about money returning to you in this case or you earning that, then that's, a, that, that's going to be a positive amount. And I'll show you how that works. So we have uh, 2000 per year. We're doing this for 20 years. So this is another variable. So 20 is going to be N per, number of time periods, okay, is 20. And we're assuming here that they're compounding it once a year. If it's, if it's stated some other way, uh, if it's stated that it's compounded three, three times a year, then um, or three or four times a year, whatever the number is, then there's a different way to figure out the time period. But we're keeping it simple here in these first examples. Um, so we have 20 years at $2,000 at a rate of 5%. So this is assuming you're earning an interest rate of 5%. Can you guys see this Excel spreadsheet reasonably well? Okay, if you can't, let me know. I can make it a little bigger. Yeah, can you please? Yeah, let me do that real quick here. Oh, whoops, not that big. Let's see here. I don't think we need 400. Let's try 200. Yeah, that's pretty good. So this is, all right, So so here is, and by the way, this is number one that we're doing up here. So we have the 2000 payment, which is negative. We have 20 years. Time period is never negative, so don't worry about that. Um, and it has an average rate of return of 5%. So rate is the interest rate. So in this case, 5%. So we have three of the five variables so far. And how these work is you, you need to find the missing variable. And so what we're looking for here is the future value. All right, see if they give us any other information. How much money will you have when you retire? Okay, so it doesn't say anything about having a starting balance of such and such. So you need to just- so wouldn't, wouldn't that be um, present value that we're doing? Because the last part of that question says, what if you started earlier in your career and invested for the amount of 30 years? Yeah, that's, that's just a slightly different future value question. And so I'll, I'll get to that after we do the first, this 20 year one. Um, so right now we have three of the five variables. We're looking for FV. What do you think, just based on your reading of this question, what do you think the present value entry should be for this? We're not given one, but if you had to- Zero. Zero, right, exactly. This is sort of assuming that you start with zero. If I don't give you a starting balance, assume zero. How about that? So this is actually zero, but when you put zero in, it doesn't matter. You can either leave it blank or zero. So that's the other thing in these, um, in these equations. Um, if something is zero, you can either leave it blank or actually enter a zero, and it should work the same way um, just as well. All right, so now we're ready to do the calculation. We essentially have four of the five variables and we're looking for the fifth. We're looking for this future value. So this is how you enter um, these functions. These are called Excel functions. If you see where it says equal FV here, this is just um, an example of what, how you start out a future value question or answer in Excel. So I'm gonna do it right here in this cell underneath FV. So I'm gonna type in equal FV and then the left bracket, okay? When I do that, you'll, if you look right underneath it, 
it now has FV bracket, and then it says rate in per PMTPV type. This is, um, this is helpful because it's telling you what information it wants you to enter next, right? So right now it has, if you look at it, it should have rate bold in bold and all the other ones not bolded and per and PFT. The bolded one is what it's looking for right now. So it wants us to put in rate. So what rate do we need for this um, particular problem? Number one, we need five, uh, the 5% 5 rate. So I can either type in 5% or I can do this. Uh, I can just click on the cell that that 5% is. It will put in the cell reference, which you don't, all C12 means is that it's in the C column on the 12th row. That's how it identifies this particular cell. So I clicked on it and then just automatically put in C12 there. So I'm done with the rate. It, it has the rate. If you hit comma, then it moves on to the next variable that it needs to figure it out. So now n per is highlighted. It's asking for n per. I'm going to do the same thing that I did with rate, but I'm clicking on n per now because that's what it's prompting me for. So I click that, and it puts in D12, which is that cell. You hit comma again. It moves on to the next variable it's looking for, which is PMT which we already figured out was negative 2,000. So I click on that and hit comma again. And now it's asked highlighting PV. So actually I'm gonna have a problem um, highlighting that cell because it's right underneath my, um, this function here. So I'm gonna type it in, but it essentially would work the same way. You click on F12 and it highlights that. So that's what PV is assumed to be, which is zero. And then the last uh, thing it'll have on, uh, I believe all of these functions, it has type. We don't need to enter type. You don't have to put in anything. So once you're done with the fourth variable here, PV, in fact, if you look at how PV is highlighted, it has those square brackets. That means that PV is optional. So you can either, uh, type in zero in this case for PV or you can leave it blank and the answer is going to be the same So if you see square brackets, that means that there's something optional that you can put in um, But if you don't put it anything in it's just going to assume that it's zero So it can save you some typing. Okay. How did you first start out? How did you get C12 in there? I Just clicked on it you put you type in equal FV and then the bracket and then once you've done that it, pro it pops up this prompt below, and I just clicked on that cell, and it highlighted it. All right, so I put in the four variables that we have so far, and now we're done entering. We just want to figure out what it is. So once you've entered all your variables, all you have to do is hit Enter, and it will do that calculation for you. So basically, it says the future value of putting $2,000 a year into an account for 20 years that earns 5%, you'll have 66,131.91 at the end of that time period. Any questions about that, what we're looking for here in, in uh, the first time value money exercise? This is the sort of math that uh, you can't do on a calculator. Um, it's the sort of math you could on a financial calculator, but it's a heck of a lot easier in Excel because all you have to do is enter the four variables and it will calculate that for you. So the other great thing about um, linking cells, like putting in the formula the way I did, is that you can change the variables and it will, this calculation will all automatically change, which is the second part of question one. I ask you in the first part, how much will you have when you retire in 20 years? The second part of that question is what if you started earlier in your career and invested this amount for 30 years? <clears throat> so any ideas on how we would figure out a 30 year calculation for this IRA? Just change the 20 to a 30. Perfect, yeah. So all you have to do is go over here to where you originally put in 20, put in 30, and 
Okay, so here's something to learn too. If you ever see all these number signs like this, it means your, your column isn't wide enough. So the way you can automatically <clears throat> make your column wide enough is to go right up here, right at the line where that column ends and the next one begins. And when you get that little cross looking thing with the two arrows pointing this way, just double click and it will automatically make the row big enough so that it can display everything. Basically, if you, if you see a bunch of number signs, your row, or your, excuse me, your column just isn't uh, wide enough to display it, so. Um, so this calculation is now showing that if we had put it in for 30 years, then you would have earned 132,877, which is quite a bit more than just 20 years, right? It's, it's basically half of that. Um, not exactly half, but pretty close to half. And that's the impact of compounding because those years 20 to 30, you're making a lot more interest on this investment per year than you are years one through 20 because your account is slowly growing. And so every year you're making 5% on a larger and larger amount. And that's called the compounding effect. It's why you start investing early, as early as possible. You want to keep your your interest bearing investments in there for as long as possible so that the compounding effect can occur. If you keep it in there for 30 years, you go from 66,000 to 132,000. And if we keep it in there for 40 years, it goes from 132 to 241. So in, that, in those last 10 years, you're essentially earning over $10,000 a year uh, in interest just because the balance keeps growing every year. Okay. But for can we back up a little bit? Basically, to the beginning, um, when you're putting in the formulas in the cells, you just went on down the line from NPR to FB to PB to PMT. Well, yeah. So if you look at the if you look underneath the cell when you type that in, there's going to be a highlight. One of those things will be highlighted, right? So right now, well, it's displaying it up there. But if you see what's highlighted, what's in bold, that's what it's looking for next. So you need to look underneath the cell to determine that. Right now it's PMT because PMT is bolded up here. You see that? So whatever's bold is what it's looking for. So it's guiding you through putting the variables in. All right, I'm going to do another one. Uh, we'll do number two and you can see how this works. David, did you put in equals FV bracket? Yeah, I'm on the first one. I got C12 in there, and I just wanted how – I got a comma, and I wanted how to put the next one. I didn't know which one. But oh, just, just click on the MPER. Yeah, you need to, you need to look at what's, what's in bold, and whatever's in bold is what you need to click on, right, once you've got it in there. So that's how it's trying to help you through the process. But let's do number two real quick. Actually, let's take a let's take a seven minute break tonight or right now, um, and then we'll come back and we'll do uh, number two here. Um, and we're going to work through these tonight, and it's going to be uncomfortable, or I shouldn't say uncomfortable. It's going to be challenging initially, but these are the things you need to practice uh, on assignments for this coming week. So let's take seven and be back at six twenty. Hey, Steve. Yeah. That's me. Just real quick. Um, so you know how question one had two parts? Do you want us to use two separate lines for those same ones? So like enter 20 for one line and then the next line will enter 30? Um, yeah, you could do that. You can either, uh, you can either enter it uh, everything in Excel or you can do your calculations in Excel and then just come over here and open up this Word document and type it in if you'd like to do it that way. So, uh, but if you are gonna leave it okay. in Excel, yeah, definitely keep two cells and make sure you label it too because sometimes it's a little confusing which cell refers to. Okay. All right. Awesome, thanks. Yep. All right, I'll be right back too. I gotta grab some more water. <clears throat>
Steve, do you have a phone number that I can call you at? Um, yeah, I can. Uh, let's see. My, oh, good. I'm unmuted. Um, yeah, I can give you my number. I'll, I'll email it to you. How about that? Okay, thank you. Hey, David, did you want to try that formula while we're on break? Actually, no, I'm going to start back up real quick. Let me, because we have, oh, Okay. yeah, thank you. We have, um, we have 40 minutes and I want to make sure I get through these, uh, the last five. So let me share my screen. <clears throat> okay. So we're going back, uh, we're going to do number two now on these, and these are just, uh, these are examples. Uh, again, the assignment uh, will look very similar to this. Um, it'll obviously have different uh, numbers in there, um, but the format will be pretty much the same. So. so number two here, the question is, you have found a wonderful home and are interested in buying it for $225,000. If the bank is willing to give you a 30 year loan at 4% interest, what would be your monthly payment? All right, so 
hint hint here on this one, we're looking for payment, right? What would be your monthly payment? So that's what we're gonna, which one of these, excuse me, which one of these five variables we're looking for, we're looking for the payment in, in this particular one. So I'm gonna do the work down here um, in the payment area, just to keep it. Can I interrupt for one second? Yep. Okay, after we got our four variables in there, we put it in another bracket, then hit enter? You don't need to put in the ending bracket. You can just hit enter. Oh, that's what I did wrong. Yeah. Yeah, once you've gotten uh, the variables in, you can just hit enter. You can, either, you can do it either way. You can put that ending bracket in, but assuming you have all the information in there already and hit enter, Excel just puts that bracket on there for you. Well, I put the ending bracket in there, and then it went to uh, Excel that said value. Yeah, the, if, if you get something that says value on it, that means that there's something that you haven't entered correctly in that formula. So you need to go back and probably do the, uh, do the equation again. I just delete the, uh, delete the cell. If you hit your delete key, if you select any cell here and you hit delete, it just takes that value away. So I just hit delete and try to enter it again. All right. But remember, you also have to have these variables in the cells if you want to, if you're going to uh, do that. So for it to work. All right. So back to number two here. Um, we're buying this house for 225,000, 30 years at 4%. What would your monthly payment be? So this one, um, we're going to use, we're looking for payment again. And we're saying we're buying it for 225,000. So that's going to be uh, 225,000 um, is actually going to be the present value of the home. It's going to be negative though, because you essentially don't own it, right? You're getting a loan on the house. So it's like seeing, as my example uh, here for number one, money is, you're not earning $225,000, you're getting a loan to pay off for $225,000. So that, think about that as negative. So the present value for this one would be negative 225,000. And that would be, I put that there. Then it says, the bank is willing to give me a 30 year loan at 4% interest. Okay, 30 years. So the end per is gonna be 30 years, but they're asking for what the monthly payment is gonna be. And that means we have to figure this out every month. We're assuming that the bank is, is compounding, in, in, in this um, question, we're assuming the bank is compounding it every month. So we have to figure out the number a monthly payment, not a yearly payment. So our time periods is actually gonna be in months, not years. So it's a 30 year loan, so 30 years. 360. Yep, 30 years times 12, which is the number of months in every year, gives you your number of time periods. So your end per is 360 for this. And it's only because the answer we're looking for is, is a monthly answer, not a yearly answer, right? It's a monthly payment is what we're looking for here. So we have to convert 30 years into the number of months in 30 years, which is 360. And that becomes our n per here for this problem. And the other variable that they give us here is interest. We have to convert that into a monthly interest rate also because it's asking for our monthly payment. So to do that, really simply, the 4% interest is an annual rate, right? It's what they charge every year. So to figure out what a monthly interest rate is going to be, and this is one of the ways that you can do, you can use Excel to do simple math. If you, you can put an equal sign in there, and then anything after the equal sign, Excel is going to assume it's trying to calculate for you. So we said it was a 4% interest rate. So I'm going to put 4% in there. And then, but I wanted to find the monthly amount, so I'm going to divide 4% by 12. So I put in equals 4% divided by 12, and that should give the monthly interest rate. So I'm going to hit enter. No brackets are necessary for this one. I hope. Yeah. So that means the monthly interest is 0.33%. Excel just calculated that based on a 4% yearly and 12 months in a year. So that's our monthly interest rate. And let's see if there's any other information we need. 
what would your monthly payment be? And then there's a second part to that question. So right now with this information, we should be able to uh, figure out what the monthly payment should be. So I'm gonna go over here, I'm gonna click equals. And so the, the function for payment is equal PMT, doesn't have to be a capital T, just PDT, um, bracket. So equal PMT bracket, and then just like the future value one, it's prompting you for what it wants you to put in and in what order. And you need to do it in the order that it's asking you for. It's gonna give you a wonky answer. So right now I have rate is bolded, so it's asking for rates. I'm just gonna click on that, hit comma, in per, I'm just gonna click on that cell, hit comma, PV, click on that. And then if you look at it, it says FV in those square brackets, which means FV is optional. Um, for questions with loans like this, the final value is gonna be zero because you've essentially paid off the loan, right? You start out with a $225,000 loan, which is your negative present value. And as you pay it off over the years, eventually, and this is the goal of anybody who owns a house, at the end of this period, you're not gonna owe the bank anything on the house. So um, you're gonna owe them zero dollars. So you can either put in FV or just not, because in this case it's zero. So I'm just gonna hit enter since I don't need to enter it. And so it tells me then that my monthly payment for a loan of $225,000 at 4% a year or 0.33% a month for 30 years, 360 month, is $1,074.18. That's how much you would be paying in principal and interest on that loan, okay? The second part of the question is, what if the interest rate were 5.5%? To figure that out, all we have to do is go click on that rate cell that we already put the information in. We put 4%, and if you click on a cell that's already entered, and you look up here at the top in, this, uh, in the formula bar, that's where you can also change uh, the contents of that cell. And so in this case, I, I had originally put in 4% divided by 12, but now it's asking me what if it was 5.5%. So remember what this monthly payment is right now, 4%, it's 1,074. If it becomes 5.5%, and all I'm gonna do here is delete four and put in 5.5. So it reads 5.5% divided by 12. I hit enter. That means the monthly interest rate then goes to 0.46% each month. And our payment increases to 1277.53 from 1074. So that's the impact of an interest rate going up from 4% to 5.5% is over $200 a month on this particular loan. So interest rate is, is uh, pretty crucial, especially in long-term loans because the bank is compounding that interest every year. So the longer it takes you to pay off the loan, whether it's a home loan, a car loan, um, credit card, the more they get to charge you interest over the long haul. So in general, everything else being equal, you wanna pay off your debt as soon as you can so that you're not paying somebody else interest on it. Um, so that's how you figure out, uh, that's a payment information I'm gonna put Number two there. So I'm going to save this document when we're done tonight and post it to week seven so that you can open it up on your computer and look at it and, and see what I've done. And I'll, I'll uh, try to make it easy to tell which is which. I'm going to number each of these, um, each of these problems we work on. So, uh, and I'll post this later tonight. So if you want to look at it later, you can. All right. So going back to Time value money exercises. All right, so we that was number two that we just did there. Um, I'm just gonna continue on. So as I, as, as I do this, I would really encourage you to do it along with me. So enter these values in the cells and just make sure that you're getting um, the same answer, hopefully. And if not, uh, then we can look at that. Um, your assignment for next week is gonna be very similar to this. It will probably have six 
uh, exercises on it. And uh, again, you'll have to figure out what function you're going to use and then enter those variables and figure it out. And there was a question at break about whether or not, um, whether you can uh, just put your, leave your answers in Excel. And that's fine, you can, you can do all your work in Excel and save it, but the one thing you absolutely have to do is to, to clearly number which of the rows, which of the answers um, is related to which question. Because if you just put them all in here and don't label which number goes to which question, then it's very obviously difficult for me to figure out uh, what to give you credit for. So if you're gonna use Excel, just label them like this somehow. Or the other thing you can do is you can use Excel to figure it out and then just go to your, your Word document and type in the answer and then save the Word document and send it to me. Um, but it's probably easier actually just to save it in Excel. Um, and the other thing that helps uh, both you and I with is that then I can look at your cells and if for some reason you're getting the wrong answer, I can look at the actual what you typed into the cell like this and determine where you're going wrong and then give you some um, feedback on that. So, I, yeah, I'd actually encourage you to learn to do it in Excel and submit the Excel document as your uh, as your homework. Okay. All right. So I'm moving on here since we have. Okay, sir. I'm sorry, but I'm still lost. Back on question one. Um. I have my four variables in there. And the last one is F11. What do I do after F11 is in there? Just hit enter. Well, F I did that. It keeps going back to the value. No, F11 or F12. I have in there C13, D11, G13, G11, F11. Wait, 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 wait. So when you're, they should all be on row 12. If Wherever you put in those variables, wherever you entered them, you need to click on that cell. So they should all be on, see, like my 5% here is in C12, it's on row 12. 20 years is on D12, row 12. So really all of your, everything you're entering should be on the same row. So if you're getting things from row 11 and row 13, then you haven't uh, clicked on the right cells. So I delete that cell and, and try again. They're all on row 12. Right, but you didn't select the right ones because you were saying it was referring to like C11 and F13. Those things should all be referring to row 12. In, in this formula up here, see like mine, C12, D12, G12. So I think he clicked on the wrong cells or at least they were entered. And the way that you figure out is that you look up in this formula bar and if you need to change something, then you can go back and just delete the last entry or delete everything and start over again. Because I think you have some bad cell references in that. Um, David, if you continue to, I wanna get through the rest of these exercises. So we can, uh, if you want, we can schedule a Zoom session to go over it. Uh, yeah, I'm totally lost, I have no idea. Well, just keep following the uh, examples that I'm doing right now because you, the entry is exactly the same for all of these functions. You're gonna be prompted for the same variable. So, so let me, let's work on uh, number three here. And so this one says, as you near retirement age, annuities begin to look like attractive investment to provide regular retirement income. So, so that you know, an annuity is something that pays you a set amount for a set period of time. And so retirees like that uh, because like in this one, it says one company offers an annuity that pays $1,200 per month for 20 years. So that's what this person is receiving back is they're going to be getting $1,200 a month for 20 years. Retirees like that because they like to have a set amount of income every month that they can plan for for a period of time. And so some of them like to buy annuities so that they can say, all right, every month, for 20 years, I'm gonna have $1,200 a month coming into my bank account from this annuity as an investment. But in exchange for that, what they have to do is they have to uh, essentially invest a large amount, a lump sum right at the beginning. And in exchange for the lump sum that they give the investment company, 
the investment company then agrees to pay this $1,200 a month. So in number three, it says they charge $165,000 for this annuity. So that's what they're gonna be paying on day one. And in exchange for that, the company is gonna give them $1,200 a month for the next 20 years. And the question is here, what is the average rate of return on this investment? So which of the variables am I gonna be looking for for number three? Anybody have an idea? I'm looking for the average rate of return of, on this investment. Great. Great, thank you. Yes, yeah, so we're looking for the rate um, variable. And so let's see what information they gave us. One company, one company offers an annuity at 1200 per month for 20 years. So that gives us two variables. And I'm gonna do that right here. Uh, the rate one right here actually. So we have $1,200 a month, and this is something the person receives. So this is actually a positive $1,200, right? It's something that they, they are gonna be receiving every month for the next 20 years. Um, they also give us 20 years, but because again, because part of this um, question has months in it, we need to convert everything to months. Everything has to be in the same time period. You can't put in some variables in year and some in month, or it's gonna give you, um, it's, it's not going to give you the right answer. It'll give you a, a, an answer that's way off probably. So since this number three has a month in it, we need to convert everything to months. So we have 20 years at 12 months, 20 times 12, so this is the way you can just do simple math in Excel. Equal, put equal, and then I just put in 20 times 12, and it will give me 240. So that's the number of months in, in 20 years, right? Number of time periods we're dealing with. And then the other piece of information that we get here is that they charge 165,000 for this annuity. Again, that's what the person has to pay up front to receive this benefit of getting these $1,200 payments for 20 years. So that's the present value. And that's what has to happen at the beginning or on day one of this. And because they're paying it to this investment company, it's a negative. So this is gonna be negative 165,000. And that is all the variables they give us for this, which is gonna be enough for us to figure this out. So the question is, what is the average rate of return on this investment? I'm looking for this rate, so I'm gonna type in, actually, I'll, one other thing I'll show you, I'll show you by doing it wrong. Here we go. So we're gonna do this uh, rate function here. Equal rate, and again, it's just gonna prompt you for what it wants. So it's asking for NPERs in bold, so I click on the NPER variable, hit comma, it's asking for payment now, click on that $1,200 payment amount, hit comma, and then it's asking for PV, present value, click on that, and then everything else is in square brackets, and I'm just gonna, and so I'm not gonna enter any of that. So right now I have rate equals rate, and then I have D18, G18, F18, I just hit enter here, and oh, look, it didn't actually calculate it. So this is one thing, if, if you ever see something like this happen where you type a formula in and it just, all it does, it doesn't calculate it, it just stays there um, in text form, is you have to look at the format of that cell. And in this case, and the where you look at that is up top here in Excel, you should have a number format. And right now this is set to text. If any cells are set to text, they'll just, Assume that you don't want them to calculate anything and they'll leave the text in the cell. So like this one right here equals rate. That's a text cell also. So if that happens, then what you need to do is change the cell format from text to number. Uh, in this case, since we're looking for an interest rate, we can put it in percentage, okay? So I'm gonna put it in percentage and I'm gonna highlight the cell again and hit enter and hope, there we go, that it calculates the rate, okay? So all I did there was change 
from text to percentage. Um, so if you ever get an entry like that, always check your cell format to fix it. So now it's telling us that the interest rate is 0.2, or excuse me, 0.52%. Uh, can I hold, can I put, place you on hold? How far back do you want us to put that percent rate, the decimal? Is it two places? Two places, yeah. So everything, okay. yeah, everything for both chapter four calculations, financial calculations, and these time value money calculations in chapter five go to two decimal places. Yeah. All right, so we have 0.52%. And this is the average rate of return for this investment, but on a monthly basis. This is what you're earning every month. And in number three, didn't specify here, but um, usually things are quoted in yearly interest rates, right? If you see a savings account earning 0.5%, that's 0.5% per year. If you have a home loan that you pay 4% interest on, that's 4% all year long, or, or excuse me, 4% for the entire year. So if you want to convert this number right here, 0.52% is a monthly rate. And if you want to convert it into a yearly rate, then you just need to multiply it by 12, right? 12 months in a year times this. I'm just going to select the cell. And that says 0 0.06. That's not in a percent format. I didn't put it in the right format. So if I put it in a percent format and add a couple decimal places, then it comes to 6.19%. Um, this is another good uh, function to know in Excel is if for some reason you have an answer that doesn't have enough decimal places, for instance, right now it's just saying six, you go up to the top, right, it should be right under that um, number or it should be right above the number format. You see a, a one button that says increase decimal, it has the zero and then the zero, zero below it. And you have one button that decreases the decimal. So it's showing fewer uh, decimal places. And so what we need to do is just increase the number of decimal places for this. And so all you do is click on increase decimal and it will add one decimal place every time you click. You can keep clicking if you want to and just get all sorts of decimal places. But the format should be two decimal places for all of these. Okay? All right, so that is number three. So the average rate of return on the investment for number three was 0.52% per month or 6.19% per year. And this is, so I'll label that three. And again, I'm gonna save this and post it to Canvas so you guys can open it and take a look at it. All right, so that's number three. <clears throat> Let's go to number four. Um, number four says the US government is selling a 30-year bond that will pay $10,000 at maturity. So that means at the end of 30 years, you'll get $10,000 if you buy this bond. And if you're seeking at least a return of 3% annually, every year you wanna earn on average 3%, what is the maximum you would be willing to pay today for this bond? So a brief explanation of how bond pricing works here, just so you know. Um, the price of bonds is, depend, or is dependent on supply and demand, just like stocks. So if more people wanna buy a particular bond, it will cause the price to go up. If less people wanna buy that bond, it will cause the price to go down. Uh, just based on supply and demand. That's how the stock market works. The, the price of a share of stock isn't determined by somebody telling you that it's worth $78.50. It's determined by thousands of people who want to buy that stock, some being willing to pay $78.50, some being willing to pay $78. And so the more people that want to buy it at a higher price, it pushes the price up. And the less people that want to buy it, in the long run, it pushes the price down. So that's how these... Um, both bonds and stocks work. Um, they're, they're, uh, they're determined by the market, by supply and demand. So for number four here, what is the maximum you would be willing to pay today for this bond? 
we're going to be looking for present value in this, right? We're asking for uh, what you would be willing to pay today. That's present value. And the information they give us is the 30-year bond will pay 10,000 at maturity, and you're looking for at least 3% rate of return. So go back here. I'm going to do four. Let's <clears throat> change this. Number four. All right, so row 15 here will be number four. So we want to earn at least 3% a year. Everything in number four, by the way, is also basically in years. So we don't have to do the month conversion like we did in numbers two and three. We just need to figure out what a 3% return is worth for 30 years. So we put just an interest rate of 3% in there for rate. And it says it's a 30 year bond. And again, we're doing this in years, so we don't have to convert to months. So we just type in 30 there for N per. And then um, we're the bond will pay 10,000 at maturity. So at the end of 20, or excuse me, at the end of 30 years, we'll have $10,000. That's a future value. And that's what would be paid to you. So this is a positive value here. We're gonna put 10,000 future value there. And what we're trying to find is the present value. And that's what, that's what we would pay today for this bond. So I'm gonna type in equals PV and then bracket. And then I'm gonna just do the same thing again. It's asking for rate first. I'm gonna click on rate and hit comma, then it highlights N per, click on that. Hit comma, highlights payment. Um, there, we haven't entered a payment right now um, because there is no payment for this first part of this question. So I'm gonna type this in since I can't select it. If you're working in a cell and it's asking you to select like the cell right next to it, you may not be able to um, select the cell be, just because of, see how the, um, the text actually flows into the next cell. And so you can just type in that cell reference like I just did G for um, the column that you're in and 15 for the row, G15. And then I hit a comma. And now it's asking me for a future value. We do have the future value for this one and it's not zero. So we need to click on that future value cell so that it has the 10,000 in it. And then whenever you see type, just ignore it. Uh, we're not gonna be using that. So I've entered all the variables that we need, hit enter again. And it gives us uh, this negative. Whenever you see brackets around a number like this, that means it's negative. So it's telling us that the present value of this bond, if we wanted to earn at least 3%, would be $4,119.87. This is what you would have to pay today in order to earn at least 3% for the next 30 years on a bond that at the end of the day is gonna pay you 10,000. So you would pay them 41.19 right now and in 30 years you would get $10,000. That's how bonds work. They pay you a, a balance of maturity. So that's present value. Uh, that's not worth the wait. Number four. Excuse me? That's not worth the wait. Uh, it just depends on the risk that you're willing to take. I mean, you, you can buy certain bonds that pay 8% for a company that's more likely to go out of business, or you can buy bonds that only pay 3% for a company that's less likely to go out of business. It's just the amount of risk that you're willing to accept on an investment. So you would get the 10,000 plus your initial investment back of um, $4,119? No, you would not. The initial investment is what you're essentially buying the bond. And so you're buying the right to have this bond that will pay you 10,000 in 30 years. And the cost of that right it, is 41.19. So you would just get 10,000 at the end of 30 years. So the difference is actually what they, what you made. What they've earned, right. So they made, a, they would make almost $6,000 in interest over 30 years. Yeah, on this bond. All right, there's a second part to question four, 
And the second part says, what would you be willing to pay if the bond also paid an annual coupon of $150 for 30 years? And whenever you see the phrase annual coupon or coupon payment, um, what that is is when you own a bond, some bonds will actually pay you every year an amount of money until the end, and then you also get this $10,000 at the end. So the second part of the question is essentially saying, what if this bond also paid you $150 every single year for those 30 years? Then what would you be willing to pay for? it? And I'll tell you, you should be willing to pay more, right? Because it's giving you an extra $150 every year for 30 years. So it's an extra $4,500 by the end of 30 years. So the way that you represent that in Excel is you leave all those variables the same. You know, we didn't enter a, a payment amount. That's where this $150 is gonna go in the payment, as a payment variable. So should this $150 be entered as a positive or a negative number? What do you think? This is coming to the person who's investing. Oh, come on, somebody's gotta just guess. Positive. Positive, yes, positive because it's, Again, think about money either going away from you or coming back to you. The annual coupon is paid to the person who owns that bond. And so if you buy the bond and you own it, then they're gonna pay you $150 a year. You're gonna get this check for 150 bucks a year in addition to the $10,000 at the end of 30 years. So I'm just gonna put 150, and I think I selected the cell, so it should change at 4119, yes to $7,059.93. So this is the answer to the second part of question four. Um, you would be willing to pay over $7,000 for something that gave you $10,000 at the end of 30 years and also paid you $150 every year for that 30 years. That's how much you'd be willing to pay if you wanted to earn at least 3%. So, that's how we use coupon uh, in a way to reflect something you're getting every year. Um, you're receiving $150 for 30 years as opposed, to, as opposed to pay it out, okay? All right, I'm gonna do five and then that's gonna be the last one we do for tonight. We'll, um, I'll cover the last one, which is the IRR, the internal rate of return um, example next week. So for this week's homework, um, I'll just ask you to do one through five um, in the assignment that I'm going to give tomorrow. So number five says here, Disney is selling bonds that pay $1,000 at maturity in seven years. The bonds are currently selling for eight, twelve, fifty, dollars And this is assuming that they're already, uh, that these bonds are already in the stock market and people are buying and selling them. And so this is what the sell price is today for that bond, eight, twelve, fifty. dollars and the question is, what is the equivalent rate of interest for this investment? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and so we're, th this is another rate question. We're looking for the interest rate uh, for number five here. So I'm gonna go down, I'm just gonna do this right here. We'll call this number five. All right, so we're looking for a rate, and let's see what they give us. $1,000 in seven years. So they give us what you're gonna get paid at the end of the bond term in seven years. So we know 1,000 is the future value, and that's gonna be positive, because it comes back to the investment. And we know that, and everything in this question is in years, so we can just, we don't have to do any conversions to month here. Seven years, so that's gonna be the time period, seven and the bonds are currently selling today, currently, for eight twelve fifty. so that's the present value. And this is what you would have to pay, so this should be a negative, negative eight twelve fifty. all right? It's going away from you. And I think that's it. So what is the equivalent interest rate for this investment? So then we do the interest rate function is equal rate bracket, and then again, you're being prompted here. So N per first, comma, payment, 
which is right now zero, comma, future value, which we do have, comma, oh, wait a second, I did that wrong. It was actually prompting me for um, present value, so I need to delete, all you have to do is, you can backspace in these just like you're in Word. I'm gonna take out this PMT, or excuse me, the FV that I just put in there, and I'm gonna put PV, it's highlighting PV right now, so I'll select that. And then it's asking for FV, and we have it, and it's not zero, so we need to make sure that we select that. So we select that, and then the last two are type and guess. If you see either of those prompts, you can ignore them. So right now, we've entered all the variables. It should, yeah, pop out 3.0%. I'm gonna add a decimal place. It's actually 3.01%. Again, everything to two, de <clears throat> two decimal places. So what this says is that if we buy this bond right now at 8, 12, 50, that's gonna pay us a thousand bucks in seven years, the average rate of interest on that bond is 3.01%. So that's how we find the interest, the average interest rate on that bond. All right, I know that, uh, well, probably for all of you, if not the vast majority of you, this is new. And one of the things that I highly recommend is that you work through these example problems on your own using this uh, spreadsheet that I'm gonna send you, just so you get comfortable entering these functions in Excel. It's, it's uh, really a, a process of repetition to learn how to do this. Once you've done it you know, 15, 20 times, it gets pretty easy and you get a lot quicker doing it. So, um, so what I'm gonna do for next week is I'm gonna post an assignment uh, tomorrow that will have five questions very similar to this the first five here. And so you need to read the questions and then decide which of the Excel functions, future value, present value, interest rate, time periods, or payment, uh, you're being asked for, and then to put in the variables and to enter uh, the equation and get an answer based on, on that information. So, um, And I'm going to re record tonight's video also, class video, so if you want to watch me go through these again, you can certainly do that um, before doing your assignment or if you're having problems. Um, so that will be for next week, will be chapter five, um, or excuse me, uh, time value money exercises out of chapter five. There'll be five of them. And I will also be posting those uh, questions for chapters one through three, the original in-class test, which is now gonna be an out-of-class test, a take-home test. Um, there will be 12 questions on that, and uh, that'll be due on Thursday at, at five o'clock. So I'll put all this stuff in Canvas um, uh, by tomorrow at five. So, that you so will we just get one chance or will we get two? Uh, what, what do you mean one chance? Um, some, some professors give us a second chance to take the test. Oh, yeah, I typically don't. I typically don't. It's, um, you know, if, it, if it's a, uh, if a test has a question that most of the students miss or all of the students miss, then I look at, determine why that is. And if it's because it was something on mine that went wrong, then I typically will just remove that question from the test and you won't be counted against it. But yeah, no, typically the tests are, um, I'll give you feedback on your assignments and you can resubmit those before the due date, but not for tests. There's only, yeah, there's two tests. Um, the last test will be essentially the last class um, of the quarter. So um, if enough, if, if the grades are low on the test, then sometimes I'll curve them up. You know, if, if everybody in class didn't do that well, I might curve it up uh, a few points, but that's how I typically deal with tests, yeah. Okay, okay so that's, uh, that's what we're gonna do for next week. We'll have class, uh, same time, same place um, next week. And again, I'll update Canvas with all these assignments in this example and the class video uh, by tomorrow afternoon so that you have all that. So, all right, any other, any questions, other questions before we sign off for tonight? Because I think it's a little after seven now. 
Well, if you have a question, you can stick around um, and ask questions, but if not, you can take off. And like I said, I will email everyone tomorrow afternoon uh, to let you know that I posted the assignments and information to uh, Canvas that we talked about tonight. Jordan, did you want to know the last part of part four or part five? Oh, I get. Yeah. So here's the other thing, just to let you know, I'm not real good about uh, being in um, Zoom and answering uh, questions via text. And so a lot of times I'll just wait until the break to answer those text questions. So if you have a question as we're going along, um, please just voice up and I can respond that way. Um, the answer to the last part of four is this 7,059, and that's including that $150 payment. If you want to see what the answer to the first part of four was, and you just delete one. He said, he said okay, just wanted to make sure. Oh, okay, yeah. Then you can just delete the payment and it'll recalculate it based on that, okay? All right, any other questions? All right, if not, um, I will uh, plan to see you next Tuesday at 5. And uh, next Tuesday, I'll give you a plan for what we're going to do for the rest of the quarter since it's rapidly approaching the finish. So. All right, well, have a good night and a good week. We'll see you next week.